Little Steven has had quite the life. You know him as guitarist for Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, a talented producer, arranger, and songwriter who's worked with all sorts of folks. He was a key part of the early success of Southside Johnny and the Jukes, of course, but also Ronnie Spector, Darlene Love, Archangels, Michael Monroe of Hanoi Rocks, and countless others. He's a solo artist in his own right, and in recent years has resurrected his band, The Disciples of Soul, a mammoth 15-piece group, and starting with the album Soul Fire in 2017, he and the band have released two studio albums, a couple of live releases, and prior to the pandemic, they were touring regularly. And how can we not mention that he was also Silvio Dante on the popular television show, The Sopranos. I'm Matt Wardlaw for Ultimate Classic Rock, and thanks for checking out our videos. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single one, and hit the notifications button to get a heads up when we have new videos. The pandemic gave Van Zant a chance to finish his new memoir, Unrequited Infatuations, which will be available everywhere you buy books on September 28th. Stevie and I talked for a half hour, and it's no joke to tell you that we could have gone much longer. Rest assured that anything we didn't cover, it's in the book and a whole lot more. Without further ado, let's get to the conversation. Well, it is a real pleasure to be holding this book, which I'll hold up as a visual aid for folks. Um, I consider you to be one of the most, one of really the almost unsung music historians in this business. Um, so it's pretty valuable to have so many of these stories collected here for posterity. You must be pretty happy with that. Well, that was the whole point of, of, of doing a book was to try and be useful, man, you know, and uh, share some of the stuff I've seen, <laughs> you know, I've seen a lot. So that was the idea. So there's the famous saying, he's forgotten more about music than you'll ever know. And I thought of that a lot when I was reading this book. And you talked about in the book how you didn't keep diaries and date books and you wish you would have. Um, you said that this is the 10% that you were able to remember. And as your book demonstrates, that's quite a lot. So for you, what did revisiting your life and times um, in this way bring out? Well, it was kind of fun. Um, relive in the 60s, you know, because you you appreciate it more now, you know, than, than you did then. And realizing how lucky we were, man, we were the luckiest generation. Um to grow up when we did. Um, I don't think um, a generation has gotten the, uh, the, the attention or the, or the, uh, or the fun, <laughs> the pure fun that we had either before or since. And um, so it was, it was fun, you know, just going through how, how we got here a little bit, you know, the, the basic history type stuff, which, uh, you know, you don't, you don't go around thinking about that stuff every day. So it was nice to, you know, kind of go there. Um, it was also, you know, trying to explain my life to me, which, which you know, uh, <laughs> remains a little bit of a mystery. But um, it was, it was good to kind of go back and see, you know, re, you know, really uh, relive why you made the decisions you made. You know, even the mistakes that you made in in your life. You know, you, you can kind of go back and see. Oh, well, okay, I can see why I did that stupid thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. You kind of. So it's a bit cathartic, you know, in that in that way, and and, and I think helpful. It it did it, it make me come, come came to some a little bit better uh, understanding of, of of some of the things I've done, and um, so you know, it was it was it was a, an opportunity. I think because of the quarantine, or else it maybe probably wouldn't never happened, you know. And, and um, my new managers, I, I never had managers, and these managers were like, you know, why don't you write a book, you know. So I said, well, maybe I can, you know, pass along some of these things I've seen. And uh, it might be, it might be time to do that because, you know, another couple of years, it's going to be down to 5% and 3%, you know, so, you know, and yeah, I sure wish I had kept a diary, especially in those early political years, you know, from just diving into these situations and learning, learning on the job, you know which is how I've kind of done my whole life really. Uh, but, you know, jumping into very serious political situations and then realizing that I had this completely analytical side of my brain, which I never even suspected, <laughs> you know? Um, I was like, wow, you know, um, yeah, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really apply this logic to my own life, but, but, uh, but I certainly can apply logic and reason to very complex political situations and and see where the answers are and see where the problems are and and and, uh, and see where the solutions are you know you can't always of course 
effectuate those solutions or, you know, that's somebody else's job. But, um, but we did have the one enormous success with South Africa and, uh, and, you know, we were lucky to have done it when we did, because frankly, we couldn't do it now, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it was interesting to me, um, I guess a couple things, when you did that Sun City project, how much did you have thoughts, um, if any, that you might get blacklisted by the industry for the whole thing? Yeah, I didn't really think about that. Um, um, you know, I was getting death threats and that kind of stuff. We don't know what you, you, you would expect, you know, the, the white supremacists were, were already, you know, already, already there and, 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 and existing, you know, they didn't, they didn't come out of the woodwork until these previous four years, you know, and suddenly they're celebrating their white supremacy. But um, they were there even then, and uh, but I didn't I, I didn't realize um, how dangerous I had become in in in, in corporation in the corporation uh, corporations eyes. You know, uh, you know, like I say, feeding people in Africa is one thing. Bringing down governments, you know, makes people a little nervous, and uh, uh, and we did. You know, that those fifty artists and all those engineers that work for free and. You know, all those musicians and and man, it was a worldwide movement. You know, uh, we were only we we only just kind of gave it a little spark, and you know, we we gave it a spark that really did put it over the finish line. But um, but it already had existed, you know, for years and uh, very very strong in Europe. Didn't it, it didn't it, it wasn't much in America though. It wasn't much of an issue in America, you know. And that's kind of how we snuck up on it, I think. You know, uh, people weren't didn't see us coming. Uh, but around the world, it was big. I mean, the unions in Europe, man, if you were on that UN blacklist, you weren't going to work, you know? So mm -hmm. they, they were really serious, uh, you know, and, and we, we, we kind of just, you know, jumped onto that train. It was already moving. But like I say, we, you know, we gave it that final kick that I think got us across the finish line. Yeah, and I wasn't aware prior to reading the book how organically Sun City becomes an actual album. And it seems like that would have been a really cool thing watching those moments which were envisioned initially kind of as guest appearances on a song evolve into their own actual songs that's so cool yeah yeah and we, we and we did we do have a documentary that came out at that time which we we won the international documentary association award for it actually but we are but we are now talking about uh, uh, really uh, updating it because uh, we got all kinds of uh, you know hours of footage that that should be seen you know interviews with everybody on that on that record and uh, Half of them are gone, man, you know? Uh, so, so, you know, I want to I wanna definitely update that documentary. I'm talking to Hart Perry, who, who you know, did the original, and, um, and, some, and some other people who uh, might, might get that going because um, it's just a great, great moment in time. And, and, and uh, it really does document how, how it became an album from, from one song, you know, in, in a totally organic way. You're so right. Yeah, I've talked to Steve Lukather about Miles Davis, and it seems like anybody that encountered uh, Miles just has great stories. And it seems like your experience with Miles was no exception. Yeah, really um, couldn't believe it when he walked in. You know, what I mean, it's just one of those guys that's just uh, a real mythological dude. You know what I mean? He's just one of those very, very rare, you know, cats that are something else, some other species, you know? And I uh, had him on my list right away, and I uh, happened to be lucky. And my my uh, one of my old sound men was his sound man, you know, and had that had that way in, and and hit upon something that happened to be a really uh, big passion of his that you know you couldn't have really known about, you know. Uh, it, was, it was just kind of we kind of got lucky with that, but he was really really into it. I mean, for him to show up, he walked in like two o'clock in the morning. And, um, you know, he doesn't, he just doesn't do those things. You know, there was, there was no, I can't think of another example of, uh, some, you know, multi-artist thing that he took part in. Uh, I think it might've been the only one. And, uh, but he was really, really serious about it. And, uh, you know, he played for like, you know, five minutes, <laughs> you know, yep. and I, and I, and I, I had like, you know, 10 seconds of him in the intro and 10 seconds in the middle. I'm like, I'm not leaving four and a half minutes of Miles Davis on the floor. What are you crazy? You know? And um, yeah, we got lucky when we called up Herbie Hancock and uh, 
you know, Ron Carter, Tony Williams, and said, you know, will you come in? And they were, and they were into it. They were into the subject matter also, and and, and the issue. And uh, and they came in and they played to what he had played, you know. And boom, there was another complete song, you know, completely legitimate and really quite artistically interesting uh, song. And that's how it went, you know. The rappers all, you know, Melly Mel does a rap, boom, you know. Arthur Baker turned it into a song, you know. Uh, 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 Gil Scott Heron, you know, rapping, you know, we, we made that into a, Arthur Baker took that and made it into a montage of, uh, um, you know, uh, news, news footage and, and cool stuff, you know, and uh, uh, what else on there? Peter Gabriel came in, just started chanting. Yeah. Weird African chant, you know, out of nowhere, you know, he's just expressing the pure painful emotion of it you know it was his song Biko that got me into it in the first place uh he just had this like cry from the soul you know uh, and then he started harmonizing with himself and then you know Tom Lord I think it was and, and uh and the drummer came in at night and put some drums on it and uh you know boom uh, you know there was another song you know and uh Bono wrote a song for the occasion, you know, it was just like, <laughs> you know, so it was, uh, it was the ultimate, uh, the ultimate organic, you know, uh, artistic uh, endeavor, man, as, as it turned out, you know, which, you know, we didn't plan at all, <laughs> you know, I mean, we were, we were hoping to get five or six artists that would take part in the single, you know, you know, one from each genre, you know, just to have everybody kind of represented and uh, boom, turn in a, 50 artists and, uh, you know, Danny Schechter, Arthur Baker and Hart Perry, uh, without those three guys, it wouldn't have happened, you know? Well, and that's just what's incredible. I mean, you talked about Peter Gabriel. I mean, it, it, the names that you got for this project, typically you read a lot of these stories, they read off the wish list, and then it's followed by, here's who we actually got after a bunch <laughs> of people said no. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's been long enough since I'd read about Sun City that I start reading that list and it's like, all right, I'm waiting for the recap here. And then it's like, I'm like, holy crap, he got all the guys like he got them all. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. Like whether it's, you know, Peter, you know, Miles, who we already mentioned, you know, Bonnie Raitt, uh, Bob Dylan. I mean, like, no stone left unturned. Like, it's a really impressive thing to walk away with. Yeah, we were just uh... Very lucky, I think, and I think it's just good timing. You know, life is life. A lot of life is is good timing, and uh, we just happened to hit the right subject at the right time. And and even though we were kind of educating a lot of the, a lot of the people who took part in it, we were kind of educating as as we went. You know, I mean, you know, some had heard about it. You know, they kind of knew a little bit about it. You know, but you know, uh, in the end, uh, we we made them all experts on the subject and. Uh, and they just everybody wanted everybody wanted to participate in that particular on, on that issue, you know, that the concept of, I mean, you know, prejudice is is you know, which continues to be a huge factor in our own country, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we did it. Um, but but you know, slavery, you know, it was down to pretty much slavery down there, and and, uh, and people were just like it was just so distasteful that people would wanted to, wanted to participate in it and. Uh, I was lucky because uh, you know, I think they sensed the fact that I'm I'm just I'm a results oriented guy. I'm not I don't I you know I, I had ADD long before it was fashionable, man. I I don't have the patience, you know, and I and I completely respect anyone who does have those the patience to, you know, feed Africans and then just, they're starving again next week, you know, and you feed them again and you you know and you feed them again. I'm like. Why are they starving? <laughs> you know, let's fix it. You know, I mean, I, I'm just, I, I, that's how I think, uh, you know, I don't have the patience to like, you know, uh, one inch, you know, gain two inches and go back one inch. You know what I mean? I just don't have the, I, I always feel like I'm trying to catch up, you know, uh, I'm, you know, kind of, I'm kind of behind, you know, I'm, and I, I don't have the time. You know? I hate wasting time. Yeah, understood. And something else that uh, I think in the book, uh, if I recall correctly, you mentioned Peter Gabriel. And um, I, I think you wrote in the book that you weren't really familiar with Peter until you heard Biko, which I think kind of speaks to something that I hear a lot from artists, which is like, and this is a good illustration of that you're so busy doing the work that sometimes you can have somebody like Peter that was with Genesis and so on that like, 
you know, until you hear Biko, he's not on your radar. Yeah, I, I, I just so happened it was that's one genre I never got into the whole prog rock thing, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I probably appreciate it more now. But at the time, you know, you are who you like and, you know, you're building your identity and uh, they just didn't fit in. They, they were in that in that muso world, you know, the, the world of more sophisticated musicians that, frankly, I didn't have any interest in, you know, I'm, I'm a song guy, I'm, you know, I'm song oriented. You know, I start losing patience after two and a half minutes. OK, <laughs> you know, so you back know. to the ADD. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's just how I am, and that's how my that's, that's how I program my radio stations. You know, I mean that's how I that's how I go through life. I'm I'm just like let's you know action, man, action, action, action. Let's keep things moving here. You know, life is just too fucking boring. You know, <laughs> let's do something about it, please. You know, uh, you know. So, yeah. The book uncovers a pretty significant beef with Paul Simon, or at the very least, a tiff. How surprised were you when that went down? And I, I love your response to both him and, you know, relaying the message to Kissinger. That's great stuff. <laughs> you know, I really like Paul. I really do. And uh, we've had some great conversations through the years. And uh, I completely respect his work. He's one of the great, great writers of that, of the second generation. Uh, you know, uh, for him to be competing with the British invasion as, as, as he did and holding his own. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment in the sixties, you know, but this is just one issue that we just, uh, we just couldn't agree on, you know, and uh, <laughs> did it to this day, you know, he still, he still thinks he's right. And I'm like, Paul, we proved <laughs> that we were, we were right and you were wrong. And, and, and he just doesn't want to hear it, you know, because he, you know, he has a you know, different philosophy about things, and I, and I understand that, you know. But, you know, to go against Nelson Mandela, to go against the ANC, the PAC, Zapu, you know, to go against the entire anti-apartheid movement, and say that you know better than they do, is a little bit arrogant, you know, a little bit, you know, <laughs> uh, you know. So he has that. He has a little arrogance in him, as we all do, you know, from time to time, you know. So. Um, I, I, I was trying to keep the, the family of music together. That's why I, I ended up not not um, criticizing uh, the, the 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 artists that had played Sun City. You know, I said no, no, no. They were manipulated. They were fooled into doing it. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And as long as they don't go back, let's just you know let's just forget it. And that's what we did. You know, we took everybody. I got removed. I took everybody off that UN boycott list who had played there. And I said, you know, they were manipulated. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And so in the end, you know, we kind of kept the musical family pretty, pretty uh, together, you know, with the exception of Paul, who went off on his own. And, uh, you know, he, you know, and he, and he, he was, you know, making great music. Um, but, um, you know, at that point, it was not, the, 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 the priority was not spreading South African music around the world. You know, the priority was freeing South Africa from slavery, uh, you know, uh, later for the South African music, you know, and, and, and we had some South Africans you know, on the record ourselves, you know, but uh, it was one of those things, you know, that just uh, never, never, you know, he was the one, he was the one exception and, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I was never mad at him really, you know, I mean, I, I just, you know, I just, I like him, I actually like him. You know? Was there anything you struggled with including in the book? Well, um, you know, uh, a lot got left out. I tell you that. I mean, you know, it could have been two or three times long, uh, bigger, <laughs> longer. You know, um, so it was. It was always a challenge. So you know, what 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 should we leave in? What should we take out? And, you know, and my editor uh, Ben Greenman was a big, big help with that. Kept me on the path. You know, I'm like. You know, let me know if I'm digressing too much because I can digress on every single page. You know, <laughs> you start off telling one story and then that's well, that leads to another story and another story, you know, and uh, before you know it, you know, uh, so I wanted to make sure we maintain the balance. Uh, yes, I realized we had to have my narrative in there, which is the least interesting part to me, but I also wanted to have the substance, what I call the substance, which is some history 
and also uh, substance about the various crafts that I have been engaged in. You know, uh, again, with the with the hope of of, of the book ended up ending up being useful, uh, first of all, and also being a bit more universal than just a book about a music guy. You know, uh, you don't have to be a musician, I don't think, to enjoy the book. I, I wanted to read like a detective novel, like a Dan Brown book, you know, where you don't know what's coming next, you know, because that's how my life's been. I, I really, I, I never knew what was coming next, really. Uh, just kind of follow your instincts and uh, do the best job that you can. The Whitney Houston incident was tough to read about. Um, do you think there's any part of that that could have been her management and not her? Well, I, I certainly would like to hope so, you know, uh, but it was really harsh at the time and uh really shocking really shocking you know cover up mandela's face or whitney use is not going on stage you know i'm like fuck you you know uh you know i was very very emotional in those days you know yeah it comes I've through come, yeah i've come, come down quite a bit <laughs> actually um so yeah i mean here's one of the greatest singers of all time and uh somebody I loved, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, you hope, you hope it was, it was management, uh, you know, saying, saying that, but, uh, who knows, you know, everybody's, you know, don't want to, don't want to hurt the career, you know, you don't want to, God forbid it costs you, you know, 10 cents, you know, cost, you know, you know a couple bucks, you know, by, freeing South Africa from slavery. You know, we don't want to, you know, piss off those white supremacists too much. You know, they're, you know they, they buy records too, you know, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. There's some great stuff in the book about Prince. What do you recall about first coming across his music? Well, I liked him right away. Uh, you know, uh, he just was, uh, really appealing and, and, and every record I, I like more, you know, I literally uh, uh, leading up to Sign of Times, which I just, just think is, is not only a masterpiece of, of a record, but the greatest show I've ever seen. Um, really uh, an amazing live show. And, 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 and luckily they did film it at least, so you can, you can see it on film. It's not exactly the same experience, to be honest. Yeah, uh, but to seeing those that set just completely transform before your eyes, you know, man, it was absolutely magical. And uh, and you know the interstitial music in between songs, it was a total three hour phenomenal experience, and uh, will always be my standard, you know. If I if I ever you know find a patron of the arts who, who wants to pay for a production of you know you know I, I go out and it's a miracle I can pay the band you know I mean especially you know these last three years you know you go out with a fifteen piece band thirty five people you know touring party not a lot of money left for production you know so you know I've never had any production really but I've always wanted I, I love live production that's my favorite thing you know. Uh, as I talk about in the book, the Broadway show that we did was uh, my favorite thing I've ever done. Yeah. So I got a chance to actually have production, you know, for the first time, uh, you know, provided by uh, Mark Brickman and, uh, and, and, and my wife, uh, very involved, you know, and so, and so you know, but I, li I like to do what I did on Broadway, you know, every time I go out with a band, you know, make a record, you know what I mean? I, I like that same experience that that Prince uh, put together for Sign of the Times, you know, it was amazing. It, it seems like you two, did you get to know each other at all? Prince? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I'm not 100% I'm not sure anybody really got too close uh, other than, you know, his early friends, you know, you know, you know, maybe, you know, the Andre Simones or whatever, you know, he actually lived with him and his family, I believe. You know, you know, a couple of the early friends, I think, probably got close. I'm not sure, you know, he was a little bit, he was a little bit uh, closed down a little bit, you know. Um, you know, we talked a little bit, he, you know, he, he wouldn't, not a big conversationalist, you know. <laughs> yep. uh, you know, and we, you know, I run into him and we, and we had some, we had some nice conversations, but nothing uh, too substantial. So, 
uh, I wouldn't say we became friends, but we were, you know, certainly friendly acquaintances. Yeah. Yeah. I loved hearing that recently that uh, Ian Hunter's a big Prince fan. That's kind of an interesting layer to him as a person. So, you know, it's just like, there's all sorts of folks out there in the world that did, doesn't seem like there's many people that Prince didn't touch in some form with his music. Yeah, no, no. Prince was, was, uh, he was one of the very few people you can really honestly call a, a genius, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I tell people, don't ever produce yourself, okay? I mean, you know, I made some mistakes producing myself, um, and really nobody should, you know. But he, he was the only exception. I yeah. mean, he, you know, he didn't lose anything by producing himself. Uh, you know, it was it's quite a, it's 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 quite an accomplishment, you know, to to not miss anything important, you know. Uh, it, it really does take an army to make a great record. And, uh, you know, and he was a one man army, you know? Well, last couple things here. Um, I know some of this is in the book, but I'd love to hear you expand a bit on the experience of working with Adam Clayton and Jason Bonham on the born again, savage record, because I first heard that album on Vince Gels's radio program piped in via the internet. And to this day, that record stands tall. I mean, stuff like salvation face of God, and especially Camouflage of Righteousness. That song sounds like Little Steven meets The Who. So it must have been pretty gratifying for you to finally get that record out to the world. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm very proud of that because it was my 60s hard rock record that yeah. I, I, I always wanted to make as a kid, you know. I was so into um, the early hard rock stuff of, you know, uh, the Yardbirds and the Kinks and The Who and the Jeff Beck group and Jimi Hendrix experience and Cream and Led Zeppelin, you know, I love that stuff. And um, and and the, the album is completely. Uh, uh, I acknowledge, you know, I, I uh, I'm so grateful to to Adam Clayton, uh, without whom it the album really would not exist. I had I had demoed it when I got I I I I finally uh, ended my touring thing in '89. Uh, and in that year, I really wrote three albums. I, I wrote uh, the Revolution album, the Born Again Savage album, and the Lost Boys album, which I still haven't released. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I demoed it in 89. Uh, I didn't know what to do with it at that point because I was conscious about being done. You know, I was, kind of, I, I was leaving the business at that point. Uh, I, I had fulfilled my five albums that I had promised myself I would write, and I had done that. Um, and I ran into Adam in some club, uh, you know, and he's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I got a bunch of stuff on the shelf. I don't know what to do with it. And he says, let's go, let's go, let's go do it. You know, I got a couple of weeks off or whatever it was. And um, so then I was like, well, okay, uh, who would be the perfect drummer for this? because it really is 60s hard rock. And I'm like, well, how about John Bonham's son, <laughs> Jason? You know, that should work. <laughs> and um, and he was totally into it, you know. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, one of them weird circumstantial things that seem to pop up a lot in my life. Um, and um, and so we, uh, we cut that thing in, uh, I don't know, mid nineties, I guess it was. And then uh, I finally put it out uh, around 99, 10 years after I, I had released, you know, recorded, written it. And uh, and now it, it's part of the Rock and Roll Rebel uh, remastering package. You know, all my stuff got remastered finally in the Rock and Roll Rebel package. And, uh, um, but I was really, um, it's the only, it's the only album I really have ever played guitar on, you know, played, played you know, that kind of guitar on you know, that, that 60s kind of hard rock style guitar. Um, most of my records, uh, you know, I have a solo here and there, you know, uh, but it was, I was always, you know, focusing on the songs, you know, and, and, you know, and the guitar parts, uh, you know, are fun, you know, but uh, it was never, never a priority. You know, the priority was always the songs. Uh, but that album, you know, I really stretched things out, stretched out the songs. Uh, you know, Lust for Enlightenment, for instance, you know, it's just, it's a real trip, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted it to be trippy because I wanted it to, it was, it was half about religion and half about sex, you know? Yeah. And where they, and where they, <laughs> and where they mix. 
and and uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was great to finally get it out. So here's the final thing, and that just is, um, it's been great seeing Bruce open up the archives and put out the live shows that he has in the recent years from the 70s and beyond. Um, a band spends a lot of time on the road just grinding it out night after night. For you, um, what's one of the more special live nights with E Street, um, perhaps even a show that was great despite all the circumstances working against it? Well, the, the one that will always stand out to me immediately uh, when you when you ask that question is, is the uh, is the uh, the bomb threat show uh, of Milwaukee. Uh, it's pretty early on, I think 75, 76, somewhere in there. I think uh, I'm not sure, but pretty early. Yeah, and uh, we there had been a there had been a <laughs> you know in those days. Uh, I know it's hard to believe, but the record company gave you a party like in every town, you know. It was, so, I mean, now if you see the record company once per tour, it's a lot. Uh, but in those days, every single town like had a party, and um, and so there was a bomb threat. I think uh, the word that we heard was uh, white supremacist. Uh, thought Bruce was Jewish. So, you know, that means immediately, well, let's blow up the theater, you know. <laughs> I don't know what the, what the logic is there. But anyway, uh, the bomb threat and uh, some anti-Semitic thing. And so um, we decided, you know, the, the record company said, well, it's going to be an hour or two to get everybody out of the theater, search all the seats, search the whole place and get everybody back in. So let's have the party now. <laughs> so, oh, wow. You know, so we had the party before the gig. And we really got hammered, man. We were really drunk, <laughs> you know. Very, very rarely went on stage drunk, you know. And Bruce was really drunk and uh, almost killed himself climbing out of the car on the way back to the gig. And uh, I was holding on to him, like, with both hands, with all my might. He was literally trying to climb on the roof of the car uh, going about 75 miles an hour um anyway you know and we we you know we, we were we went we immediately reverted back to our bar band uh days you know and we opened with a little queenie you know chuck berry song and you know <laughs> and i just remember that being like the greatest show we ever did now that may have been just my my drunken uh <laughs> you know, my my drunken uh, uh, sort of feeling at the time. You, you know, but um, I don't know if that did ever did that ever get released. I, I wonder. I, I don't know. I don't think that one's out there at this point. But yeah, that was just checking on that. That was seventy five in Milwaukee, by the way. Yeah, it might have been too early for anybody to even tape it. You know, I, I don't know. Legendary um, show, though. I mean, you're right, and I think there are at least some fan recordings out there for sure. Uh, maybe yeah maybe so we can see how good it was or wasn't uh how, how well your, exactly. your drunken memory holds up you know <laughs> yeah well hey let me let you run on man but um you know thank you for all the music and you know thanks as always for the time here and uh you know good luck as you get out there with this uh this opus uh you know reading is fundamental so there's certainly plenty here for folks to enjoy so so thank you man as always my pleasure there he goes, Stevie Van Zant. Don't miss his memoir, Unrequited Infatuations. You can find more from Stevie by clicking the link in this video's description and make sure to subscribe to our UCR channel here on YouTube for all of the best news and history of classic rock and pop culture.